2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord, it's salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. And as in all his epistles or letters, speaking of them things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that do are unlearned and unstable, they twist, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before, beware lest you also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. So what should we do then? Verse 18 tells us. We, in this room, as disciples of Christ, are to, notice please, grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Father, bless the reading of Your Word and now the teaching of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's the plan. I want to unpack verse 18 in the significance of growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to communicate to you this morning that there is a biblical expectation that you are growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to create for you for just a moment an imaginary scenario whereby instead of it being SATs, we come up with a standardized test of your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 250 questions of, the, of your knowledge of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every year on an annual basis, we pass it out to the entire church and then we track how well we as a church are growing in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'm here to suggest to you that one of the significant problems we have as Christians on the planet is that we say that we're bananas for Jesus, but we know so little about Him. In fact, most of us, if we're abundantly honest men... We know more about our sports teams, their scores, their players, than we know about the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be a significant embarrassment to us when we say, He is worthy of my undivided attention, my devotion, and my love, and I know so little about Him. It's, it's, it's frankly, it's pitiful. Frankly, it's embarrassing. It's absurdly embarrassing. And the commandment in verse number 18 to each and every one of us, male and female, all of us in this room, is that we are supposed to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that if we were to take a 10-year path, we could track a progressive increase in my knowledge of who Jesus is because I am growing in my knowledge knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that's our agenda this morning. I want to talk about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk about his role as a prophet, priest, and king. I want to look at his life as a, as a narrative that from birth to ascension. And if you think for just a moment this is ridiculous and pastor is overreacting, I'm going to challenge you this week to set aside 15 or 20 minutes, get out a yellow legal pad with no help, and just start writing down everything you know about the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And see how long you can keep writing. Tell the story. Walk the dog from birth to ascension. M map out the timeline. Map out the milestones. Put some key points on there. And just challenge yourself. How well could I take someone who knows nothing about Jesus and introduce them to my Lord and Savior? Let me tell you about Jesus. Do you have a minute? And then just start talking. And what are the bullet comments that you would write down as you map out the life of Jesus? Because I'm afraid that we could do more about telling about a football player or a baseball player or our favorite politician or a Civil War buff, one of those generals, than we could the man who died for our sins. And so let's get started with that very idea. Galatians 4.4, 4, the, the, Paul, the author, writes, 
But when the fullness of time was come, the fullness of time, we're not just going to run over that phrase. Paul is saying at the decisive moment, the, the moment orchestrated by God, the moment that he built up. What do you mean built up? I'm saying starting with Adam and Eve, God was orchestrating and providentially preparing the way through 4,000, 5,000 years of human history to a decisive moment where God says, now send the sun. Now the conditions are set. You know this military man. You understand the idea of setting the conditions. You understand about orchestrating a battlefield and getting ready for the exact moment when you're going to launch an attack. You're going to achieve a desired result. What I'm suggesting to you this morning is that for 5,000, 4,000 years, God was doing just that. Setting the conditions, getting everything ready. And Paul says, and when the fullness of time was come, God sent his son made of a woman. We estimate that to be between 6 and 4 BC. The Greek language was fully developed as the language of the known world. The Romans had established a universal road system and the Roman peace was in full force. The term Pax Romana, which literally means Roman peace, refers to the time period between 27 BC and 180 AD in the Roman Empire. This 200 year period saw unprecedented peace, economic prosperity throughout the empire, which sp spanned from England, here's England in the north, to Morocco in the south, we have some friends in Morocco, and Iraq in the east during the Pax Roma, the Roman Empire reached its peak in terms of land area. Its population swelled to estimated 70 million. And that exact conditions, David, is what God used to bring us the church. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited about this. Because next Sunday we're going to Acts chapter number one. And we're going to work through Acts. And I am excited. I know I am and you're not. But let's get excited. <laughs> Okay, because we're going to study the Word of God. We're going to see this thing grow. And this tiny little mustard seed is going to become this giant tree. Right. The author Luke's going to use the word, turn the world upside down. How'd this happen? Well, part of the way it happened is that God set the condition through a universal road system and then a peace so that the apostles would not be fighting against war and dividing sides and all that. That the Romans would have the condition set for the gospel to go forward. And God's people said, amen for God's providence. So let's start with the foundational point. Jesus Christ is not a created being. He is not a created being. The Mormons are wrong. The Jehovah Witnesses are wrong. The Muslims are wrong. The, Jesus is not a created being. Hindus, Buddhists are wrong. John 1 is very clear. John 1 is very clear. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, which includes Himself. Which includes himself. Because if in fact he is a created being, then all things cannot be made. It needs to say all things but one thing. But all says all. And we move to verse 14 and we learn about this thing that we call the incarnation. Yes, a theological term. Yes, a theological term on Sunday morning. Because the church is pitifully ignorant. It's pitifully ignorant. It's embarrassing how ignorant the church is. Knowing so little about our Savior. Knowing so little about the Bible. Here's the concept for just, this, uh, uh, just a moment this morning. In the category in Jeopardy named Jesus. 200, 400, 600, 800. You know that what I'm talking about? We ought to just be excelling. Give me the Jesus category. I tear it up. That's the idea. All the other nonsense that's on there, don't clutter your mind with all that nonsense. Okay? It's unbelievable what people know on there. Just trivial minutia. Okay? I was going to use a different word, but I chose that one. Okay? Um, but when it comes to the Jesus category, when the name Jesus goes up there, we ought to be ready to play. Okay? Give me Jesus. Okay? When you get the Daily Double... Put it all on the table because I know the category. You understand the concept? That's what we're going for this morning. That's the concept. 
So the word incarnate means God-man. He's God in flesh. So we have this amazing, unique miracle on the table here. God's among us. God's dwelling among us. This man called the Christ. It's not his last name. Okay? It has, a, it has a, 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 a meaning behind it. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the uber anointed one. You thought it was cool when we anointed prophets. You thought it was cool when we dumped oil on priests. You thought it was great when the prophet came and, and anointed the, uh, King David or King Solomon. This is the uber, the uber anointed one. He's the ultimate. He is the Christ. Now, now, let me remind you this morning, the reason we're going into this detail is because the expectation is that every one of you, in some form or fashion, are teachers. You're teachers with your grandbabies, you're teachers with your children, you're teachers with your Bible class, you're teachers in Sunday school, you're teachers on Wednesday night youth group, you're teachers in Awana, you are teachers. And so you're learning, but not just to impress yourself with your own intellectual knowledge, but to share it with others. So Christ is the anointed one, it's literally the anointed one. And what about the name Jesus? Why name him Jesus? For, preposition, he will save them from their sins. The name Jesus has meaning behind it. He's the Savior. He's Jesus. What do you name him? Don't name him Bob. Don't name him Tom. Don't name him those names. Name him Jesus. Why? Because he's going to save them from their sins. The, the, the name Emmanuel. Behold, a virgin shall uh, uh, be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Why? Because God's with us. God's on the planet right now. God's in the village right now. God's in the synagogue right now. Praise God, he's with us. He's among us. And then finally, he's the only begotten son. He's the one and only. There are no two. There are no twins. There's no half-brothers. God didn't have sex with Mary, uh, Mary in this Mormon nonsense and have two. He's the one and only. He's the only begotten. It's Jesus. So let's review. Eternal. He's not a created being. He saves his people from the sin. That's why we're calling him Jesus. He's the Christ, not a last name. It's the Messiah, the anointed one. He's God with us with the word Emmanuel. He's God incarnate, which is in the flesh. And he's the one and only. He's the only begotten. He's born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophet of Micah. He escapes to Egypt. He grows back up in Nazareth, and he makes annual trips to, uh, for the Passover to Jerusalem, and that's his childhood. We know that we have this amazing miracle going on because he is God in flesh, and at the same time, he has to learn. He does have to learn. He has to learn language. He has to learn to walk. He has to learn to talk. He has to grow in wisdom. And yet, at the age of 12, he's blown away the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and scribes at the temple with his knowledge. Why? Because he's up to his father's business. His father's business. At the age of 30, when he began his ministry, about the age of 30, the same age that most Jewish men would enter the priesthood, he starts his adult ministry around the age of 30. It begins in Matthew chapter 3 with his baptism, and we get this amazing authentication. This is my son. This is my beloved son right down here, and, and the ministry starts. Immediately after that in Matthew 4, he gets launched out for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted. He's tempted in every capacity, all kinds of ways, and every time, what does he use, church, to overcome the temptation? Tell me. Scripture. It's Scripture. And so ask yourself, if I'm struggling with sin, how much scripture do I know? Because the way he overcomes sin is not a patch. Right. It's scripture. Amen. It's scripture. This is the word of God. This is a two-edged sword. This is powerful. Write it down on a three-by-five card. Put it on a yellow sticky note. Write it out on your mirror. Put it on your refrigerator. Saturate yourself with Scripture. Believe in the power of the word of God. Jesus used it. And thus we can say in Hebrews chapter number four that we have not a high priest, which cannot be. That's a double negative there. The idea being the reverse, which is we have a high priest who knows what it's like to be a human being. He's been there, done that. He's got the t-shirt, brother. Okay. He knows what it is to be depressed. He knows what it is to be sad. He knows what it is to be struggling. He knows what it is to be frustrated. He's been where you're at, yet without what, church? 
sin, no sin, not a little sin, not a tiny bit of sin, no sin, no, none sin whatsoever. And the ministry starts with calling of the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John. We've got to get some men. We've got to start building a foundation here. There's a church to be launched in the future. And I need men to know and understand the word of God and be properly taught and to set the conditions. And so he calls 12, as you well know. Matthew number 4, uh, chapter 4, 23, gives us a great summation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And essentially, you can tell somebody that the ministry of Jesus Christ comprises two primary things, one teaching and one miracles. That's really the essence of what he does. And they're pretty much like this, church. They're pretty much like this all the time. Everywhere he goes, he's teaching and doing miracles over and over again. Matthew 4, 23 says, And Jesus went about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Remember, not churches. There are no Christian churches at this point. There are none. He's going to the Jewish synagogues. He gets in there, and if they give him an opportunity, he gives it to them. He, he's preaching them about the kingdom of God. And then wherever he goes, he's healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. And in fact, we really can't fully grasp the degree to which Jesus is doing miracles. Quite frankly, it's overwhelming. If you read, for example, Matthew, any of the four Gospels, you get little statements like this, David. Healed them all. Yep. Healed them all. Went into the village and healed them all. All? Yeah, all. all. In other words, everyone. Yeah. In other words, each and every one. Like miracles beyond comprehension. In fact, the end of John, I think it's around chapter 19, John says that if, the, if the, all that he did was recorded, the books of the world could not contain it. Right. That's right. I mean, in other words, we don't have any degree of full knowledge of how many he healed. Wham, 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 wham. All the time. Doing it, doing it, doing it. Overwhelmed. Everywhere we go. More and more. Bring them here. Bring them here. Let's go. Just exhausted. I mean, just physically exhausted, just dealing with people and taking care of them. It's really amazing. In fact, until his death, Jesus is either performing miracles, teaching, praying, or resting. I mean, that's the essence of his life for three and a half years, setting the conditions to go to a cross. John 3, 2, you know this story. And the same came by Jesus by way of night. This is Nicodemus and said unto him, Rabbi, teacher, master, we know that thou art a teacher of God because nobody's doing the miracles that you're doing. It just can't be done if you're not from God. In Matthew 2, 21, 11, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And this is, in fact, fulfillment of the Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18 promise that God gave Moses. The promise went like this. Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18. The Lord thy God will raise up in thee a prophet from the middle of thee, or in the midst of thee, of thy brother. And he's going to be a Jew like unto me, and unto him shall you hearken. You'll listen to him. I will put them among a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I have commanded him. That's Jesus, not Muhammad. Not Muhammad. And they're not sharing anything. Jesus is the ultimate and full and complete fulfillment of the promise that God made to Moses. The ultimate. You say, that's just your Baptist opinion. All right, let's do this. Let's do this, since you think it's my Baptist opinion. Let's take everything we know about Muhammad and compare it to the life of Moses. And let's take everything we know about Jesus and compare it to the life of Moses. And then you tell me what you find out. Because what you're going to find out is that Jesus does all kinds of Moses things. All kinds of Moses things. For example, Moses parts the water, Jesus just walks on it. Yes. Hello? Yes. <laughs> and it doesn't stop there. It goes on and on and on. My point is, you don't believe something ridiculous. It's solid. It's reasonable. It's objective. It will do well in a court of law. Amen. Next slide, please. Jesus is the Lord. He's the Lord. He's the King. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The power he has is amazing and undeniable if the Bible's true. And we believe the Bible's true. It's overwhelming. Every single miracle has as its primary purpose the authentication of the messenger. Every miracle. It authenticates Jesus, 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 from God, from God, from God, from God, God, God. 
He turns water into wine. He heals all manner of diseases. He makes the blind to see. He causes the deaf to hear. makes the mute to speak. He can calm a storm with his words. And we don't grasp it. I mean, come on, let's just face it. We just sit here. What we need to do is at a Christian amusement park, David, we come up with this ride, all right? We get a little pond of water like down at um, Broadway at the beach. What's that, Broadway at the beach? You know that water area right there? And we put like a Galilean boat out there and we have that thing rocking all over the place, right? And you're seat belted in there and you're like thrown away and you're thinking, and then at the moment, the man stands up and says, be calm. And instantly everything shuts down. Okay, that was ridiculous, preacher. I'm trying to help you understand what it might have been like to be on that boat on the Sea of Galilee when they all thought they were going to die. That's right. And in one split second, Jesus says, be calm. And everything immediately. Yes. And you know what they say? Next slide. What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Who is this on the boat? Who is this? Who, what, what kind of guy is this? See, we're looking at it with our 2020 vision with 27 canonical books. You need to understand that they were growing in their knowledge of who Jesus was. They were wondering, is he another prophet? Could he, is this the one? Is, is this the one? Could, could it be him? Is, is it, it we've, we've been waiting We've been anticipating. Malachi told us that another one was coming. Is it him? It can't be John the Baptist because he's in jail. You remember? He's beheaded. He's dead. It can't be him. Could it be Jesus? Could it be? And they're asking, what manner of man is it? He casts out demons. He heals the paralyzed. He cleanses the lepers. He directs fish to a net. I mean, fishing with Jesus is glorious. (laughs) I mean, it's just unbelievable. You always have a good day with Jesus. He's walking on water. He's causing Peter to walk on water. I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's really beyond human comprehension. He puts a coin in a fish's mouth. He doesn't write checks when it's time to pay taxes. He's feeding thousands with almost nothing. He passes through crowds unseen when they want to stone him. He just goes through. He restores ears like the ultimate plastic surgeon. Whoop. You get that sound effect? Done. (laughs) Causes a tree to die, raises the dead multiple times. We normally think of only Lazarus, but the text indicates he does that on a regular basis. He's raising the dead. The miracle, that one of the only miracles, it may be the only one, but I'm pretty sure uh, it, it's one of the only ones that's recorded in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. The crowds are just assembled, the masses. At the end of the day, the disciples are just exhausted. Send them away. Send them back to the villages. We need a break. And Jesus says, feed them. And they say, with what? We got a couple of fish and some loaves here. We don't have enough to feed these people. And Jesus, bring it to me. And he blesses it and he breaks it. He doesn't have to pray to the Father to bring manna down from heaven. He is the bread of life. He just provides it. And the biblical text is unbelievable. It says they all ate till they were full. And then they gathered the leftovers and there were baskets and baskets of leftovers. And the number that they fed is probably more like 15,000 because the text says there were about 5,000 besides the women and children. So it's unbelievable what he can do. Church, as we read the Gospels, as we read Matthew, as we read Mark, as we read Luke, as we read John, as we study our Bibles, as we're due diligence in looking at the life of Christ, we look at it and we say, what can I get out of this? So I'm reading Matthew 9, Matthew 14, Matthew 15, Matthew 18, Matthew 18, and Matthew 20. And I notice this theme. I notice this pattern in in uh, chapter 9. But when he saw the multitudes, he moved with compassion. 14. And when Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, he moved with compassion. Chapter 15. Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Chapter 18. The Lord's servant was moved with compassion. He loosed him and forgave the debt. 
verse 33, chapter 18. Shouldest thou also have compassion on thy servant, even as I had pity on thee? Chapter number 20. And Jesus had compassion on them. Look, I can't be like Jesus if I'm not compassionate. And I know who I am. I have a, I have a hard time with being compassionate. I, I am, my default position is sinner. Fix it yourself. Get up. Go to work. That's not Jesus. Jesus is moved with compassion when he sees people. He's not staring, standing there arrogant in a judgmental spirit. It's, it's, I need to look at this and look, remember uh, chapter number three, verse 18. But you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this isn't just an intellectual pursuit of information. This is, let me take this in and examine it and confront my own sinful nature. Jesus' teaching ministry involves really two kinds of ministries. One is disciples, three on, uh, one on three, one on 12, 70, smaller groups, looking to do some serious instruction, some serious Bible study, really working with individuals to get them to grow in their knowledge of the kingdom of God. And then, of course, the multitudes, the larger groups. And the point of the matter is, is that each and every one of us should be involved in teaching the Word of God in some form or fashion. It is absolutely pitiful that we have to beg for teachers. That should not be the case. I want to be like Jesus. Let me teach. And typically, it's an excuse. I just don't have the gift. Make sure, make sure that that's the real reason and not apathy or laziness. Because God expects us to communicate the truth. The disciples were to create disciples who create disciples who create disciples. It sounds a little bit like the Great Commission. Amen. Go you therefore into all the world and make what, church? Disciples. It starts in first grade. It starts in kindergarten. It starts in Sunday school. What are you doing to teach the Word of God? It starts with your children. It starts with your grandchildren. It starts with Christian education. And on and on and on, looking for every opportunity to teach others the Bible. Matthew 5, 1 to 2, and seeing the multitude, he went up to the mountain, and when he was with him, his disciples came to him and opened his mouth, and he taught them. Matthew 13, great multitudes, and he spake unto them parables. He spake unto them parables. What are parables? They're simple, short stories designed to illustrate a moral or spiritual truth. And the parables are incredible. The parable of the sower went forth to sow. This would be a great Sunday school series. Work through the parables of Jesus. What are you going to do as a Sunday school class? We're just going to work through the parables of Jesus. We want to look at all of them, one to one or two a week, looking at all the parables to understand them inside and out. What's the, what's the illustration? What's the spiritual truth? What's the illustration? What's the spiritual truth? This is not about agriculture. Four soils are not about agriculture. This is about human hearts. The seed is not seed. The seed is the Word of God. The sower is the evangelist. It's, it's the... It's the Sunday school teacher. It's the preacher. It's the soul winner. Parables about the kingdom of God. Parables about loss and redemption. Parables about love and forgiveness. Parables about prayer. Parables about the end times like the Olivet Discourse. They're just incredible. How many could you name? Three? Four? How many could you talk about reasonably well? One? Two? Two? What are you trying to do this morning? I am trying to challenge us as a tr church to understand the significance of knowing the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Would you turn over to Luke? Luke, please. Jesus was often answering questions. Answering questions. Often answering questions. 
Let me talk to all my Sunday school teachers that teach children, all, everyone that works with Awana on Wednesday night, anybody that teaches in our academy. If a student asks you a question, deal with it. Stop and deal with it. If you're not equipped to answer it, write it down and say, I'll bring you an answer next week. They have a question, it's reasonable. In the same way that you expect your questions to be answered, they do too. And the greater degree to which we entertain their questions as legitimate questions is the greater degree that they understand we're taking them serious as students of the Word of God. That we're okay with them thinking. Because that's what creates questions. A student asked a couple years ago, why is it okay for God to be so consumed with his own glory, but I can't? Why don't you answer that this week and send me an email? I don't want to think this week. Yeah, I know. That's the whole problem. We want to watch YouTube videos and play silly little games on our phone. Man, I could get on a rant right now because I'm just so consumed with the degree to which we're wasting life on these little video games. I was walking through the auditorium this morning before the service and I saw 15 church members just staring at their phones. Would you please stop staring at your phone and talk to a human being? We come together in this corporate assembly not so that we can update our Facebook status. We come together so we can talk and commune and look at each other and interact, have face-to-face eye conversations and have real legitimate conversation. I'm not talking about 140 characters in a tweet. I'm talking about a legitimate conversation, eye-to-eye, person-to-person. Let's deal with real issues. Put your phone away. You see it. Not for minutes. Not for minutes. You can burn up an hour of time on a silly video game on your thing, and you're never going to get that hour back. That's right. That's right. It's gone. We know nothing of the story of Jesus, and we can play Angry Birds until we get to level whatever it is. So behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him in chapter 10 of verse 25. said, Master... What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? It's a great question. And you know what Jesus says? I got a different lesson to teach. I don't have time for that question. No. No. He stops and deals with the man's question. So much of evangelism is completely misguided because we're on our agenda and we don't deal with the person where they're at. Meet them where they're at, deal with the issues that they have, confront those issues, and then let the Lord open the door for the next question. So they ask the question, Master, what do I can do? And he says, let me ask you a question. What's written in law? What do you think? What a great response. It almost sounds like a conversation. And he said, he answered, said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. It's a great, good answer. That's solid. That's solid. And he goes on to say, Thou hast answered right. Do this and thou shalt live. He, being willing to justify himself, wants to press it a little bit more and say, Could you define my neighbor for me? Is it like 500 feet? Do I got to get the guy's diagonal or is it just straight across from me? You know, I need an answer. And he goes on to say, Let me tell you about a man. And what do we get? We get the amazing parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm trying to illustrate to you how a parable comes to being. It's not just a story. It answers a question. By the way, dads, dads of five-year-olds, dads of eight-years-old, dads of 10-years-old, 11, 12, how about stopping and doing a family devotion on a parable? We're just going to talk about one parable tonight. Let's talk about one parable tonight. All right, what's he saying? Now, what's the spiritual truth behind it? You could do it. And you're so intimidated, but I promise you, if you just did a little bit of research, dads, you could do it. And you're intimidated. You'll, tell, you'll teach him how to play baseball. You'll show him how to change his spark plug. You'll teach him how to change his brakes. But nothing when it comes to spiritual truths. Teach him how to golf. 
Teach them how to build a doghouse? What about spiritual truths? Parables were often taught to explain who Jesus was, like this one. He began to speak unto them about the parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine vat and built a tower and led it out to his husband and went into a far country. Just stop and take that one verse, guys, and say, let's, let's create a visual picture, all right? So you get out a coloring sheet and you color out that, all right? Where would the tower be? You put the tower right there. I'm trying to tell you how you could do something other than play video games. Put the tower right here. All right, what, where would the wine vat be? It'd be right here. All right, why do we have a wine vat? All right, that's where they take the grapes and they go in there with their nasty toes and jump up and down. You talk about some extra flavoring to the wine. <laughs> hey, Pam, there's no antibacterial soap back in those days. You're getting it all. Okay? You talk about getting the fermentation process started right away. Okay? He goes on and says, Then at the season he sent his husband a servant that he might receive from the fruit. They caught him and beat him. They did what? They beat him. Sent another one. They wounded him. Sent another one. Sent another one. Then what? Then he said, I'll send him my one son. And that's where you stop as a dad, as a Sunday school teacher, as an Awana worker, as a Christian teacher, and you say, let me tell you, who is that one son? And let the students come alive with the Word of God when they can discover and answer for themselves. Man, I'm motivated to get you excited about studying the Bible. Because once they get on board with reading Scripture and realize that they can interpret it and understand it, it'll come alive to them. When they say, that's Jesus, you go, yes! (laughs) I'm here to scare you, sister. Because you know what? We'll go like that when they score a soccer goal. We'll get all crazy when they make a catch. They put that ball in the goal, and we think that's the greatest thing on the world. They scored a point. Glory to God. We need to be getting just as excited when they understand the Word of God. Amen. Just as excited. Jesus said that, Nicodemus said, that's a teacher. That's a teacher. But that's not what Peter said. When they asked Jesus, when they asked Peter, who do you think that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do you say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Who, who, who? Who do you say that I am? And that's a great question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? In Matthew 17, after Peter's amazing declaration that he's the Son of God, God takes Peter up to the mountain and says, let me show you who he is. It's not an accident that Matthew 16 is Peter's declaration and Matthew 17 is a transfiguration. It's not an accident. It's strategically placed there to make the connection between the two. Peter says, you're the son of Christ. Flesh and blood is not revealed to my father in heaven. And then the father transfigures Jesus in his presence. And then a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. And then it says, listen to him. Listen to him. When you show your students, your children, your grandbabies these kind of truths, the Word of God will begin to come alive to them. And then sometime during his adult ministry, there's a significant change that occurs. It's it's drastic. Luke 9 records it. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is a turning point. In fact, it's interesting because the text says, as the fact that the ascension was coming near... He's got to get ready to go to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem, church? He's got to die. He's got to die. He's got to die. The kingdom's being taken away from Israel and given to us. Jesus Christ, the prophet, is now Jesus Christ, the priest. And every detail of the Passion Week has been orchestrated down to the specific day and hour that Christ will be crucified. Nothing is left to chance. Everything is orchestrated by God. He predicts it. Just like Jonah, that's me. Three days and three nights. The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to give his life. John chapter 10, John chapter 15, 15, 17, and 18. I laid down my life. 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 This is not an ambush. This is predetermined by God before the foundation of the world. And in chapter 21, we start with this amazing Palm Sunday. And we ask ourselves, we legitimately ask ourselves, how in the world 
did we go from on the Sunday before his death, the crowds are thronging him and taking palm branches and hailing him, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. How do we go from four days later going, crucify him? How do we do that? That's a legitimate question. We ought to be able to answer that. That's a reasonable question. And part of the answer, of course, is God's sovereignty. But part of the answer is in the fact, David, that they were looking for a king to overthrow the Roman Empire. And when he doesn't start doing that, they're done with him. They're done with him. They weren't looking for a man to go to a cross, brother. They weren't thinking about a gospel like that. They were thinking, it's now time to overthrow the Romans. You say, why would they get that idea? What do you mean, why would they get the idea? The blind can see, the lame can kill. He heals anybody. You don't need medics in his army. Food problems? He feeds 5,000 just like this. Calms the wind, the sea. This man can do what no one else has ever been able to do. Surely he's the one that's going to overthrow the Romans. And yet that's not what happens at all. They're, they are so boggled by that. That's not what happens at all. The next day he's cleansing the temple. What are you doing cleansing the temple? You're sort of uniting the Jews to overthrow the Romans. And instead of rebuking Romans, you're rebuking Jews. And they realize we can't control this man. He has his own agenda. And because he has his own agenda, he'll have to be killed. Of course, that's God's plan. God's plan is to turn their hearts to where they will kill him. So he takes his disciples and they get away to the Mount of Olives. And they say, tell us about this because now they're confused. They're legitimately confused. They're not asking the question for us. They're asking the question for themselves. They thought for sure we're going to overthrow the Romans. And instead, you're turning the temple upside down. And you're talking about your own body as a temple. We are confused. Could you tell us what the future holds? And he lays out the entire Olivet Discourse for them. Here's a great, great family devotion idea. Go to the internet, get this picture, grab the family around it and say, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. And just talk about it. All right, now let's go look at what the Bible has to say. Talk about how the fact that they would have been reclining instead of sitting like this. Talk about how the fact that they would have all been around the table like this. Talk about every little detail. Get your little thinkers thinking. And by the way, here's something really radical. When you get them around the Bible... Put the phones in the other room. There you go. Yep. I know you're looking at me like this guy has lost his marbles. You can go minutes without your phone. That's right. Yes, sir. You know what they'll do? We used to say it like this. They'll call back if it's important. That's right. <laughs> you remember that? Yes. They'll call back. Yep. We're at the point now where we feel like we can't miss a single message. Man, hey, 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 we're going to figure out what's wrong with this picture. And by the way, you could get into some normal history. You could say, now who wrote it? I mean, who, who, who painted it? What year? What other things did he paint? It would almost be like education. <laughs> the same Jews who welcomed him on Sunday demanded his death just days later. Demanded it. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane? How many things happen in the Garden of Gethsemane? How many movements are there? See how you could just come alive with this? What are we going to learn this morning in Sunday school? We're going to learn about everything that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, then Jesus as our king. I'm almost done. Just stay with me for another minute or two. And I love, David loves it, and I love the way David opened up to me. The way God is using Pilate is an amazing thing. Pilate is virtually a prophet. It's so cool. Uh, they cried, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? Pilate's calling Jesus a king. And they, they bring their own destruction upon themselves when they say these faithful words. We have no king but Caesar. This is where you as a Sunday school teacher stop and you talk about the 70, 80 judgment occurs because of these words right here. You teach them history. You show them the remarkableness of the Word of God. And then we move over to here. Pilate says, which one do you want? And of course, they clamor for Jesus to be crucified and give us the murderer. And then Pilate writes down Jesus, the king of the Jews. 
And he raises the sign up. And you can just see it. It's just awesome. And then, no, don't write that. And he says, don't you tell me what to write. I write what I write. And it's just like the Lord gave him those words right then and there. Tell, say he said he was like, no, 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 no. I write what I write. It's so good. Make the Word of God come alive to your students. This is better than any Hallmark movie. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Walk through what happens. This is one of the seven sayings on the cross. Do you know the other six? That's another great Sunday school lesson. Look at all seven of them, one at a time. Do you know that Jesus says to John the Apostle, take care of my mom? Which gives us a little bit of maybe why he's not so involved in the very beginning early days. Because he's taking care of his mom. And doesn't that speak to us? It's not so security that's supposed to take care of my parents. I'm supposed to do it. Right. All right, we're almost done. Joseph of Arimathea provides the tomb, you know that, so that Isaiah 53 can be fulfilled where he's buried with the rich and yet he's crucified with the wicked. And then he's risen. And I remembered this song, John, that's when I emailed you. And I was singing it, man, I wanted to sing it in church. Up from the grave he arose. I, wanted, I was singing it out loud, I was actually practicing. Then I get in front of you guys and I get nervous. But this is an amazing song. I know it. I could sing it. I mean, it would be off key and remarkably miserably, but I know this song. He arose. He arose. Am I getting a little bit close? Yeah. It's an amazing song and it describes this unbelievable climax. He's, he's there. And we used to sing, hallelujah. Well, I wish I could sing. And then we get 40 days. 40 days of infallible proofs is the way Luke records in Acts chapter 1. This is on the road to Aramaeus. That's a great story. Just a great story. He says, Moses and the prophets, this is me. He gives us the great commission, tells us to make disciples, and that's why we're preaching like this this morning. Because we understand that disciples follow Jesus, and you can't follow somebody you don't know. And then we move to Acts chapter number one more, and that's where we'll pick up next Sunday morning, Acts chapter number one. Let's pray. I pray this morning that you were encouraged and motivated to study the life of Jesus a little bit more. Could you say amen? Could you move your hand? Could you nod your head? Could you let the Lord know in some form or fashion that this morning you were just a little bit more encouraged to study the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? to know the miracles, to know the parables, to be able to talk intelligently about the narrative, to walk the dog from his birth through his ascension. Milestones, key events, high points, low points, the turn of the direction where he moves from the Jews to the Gentiles. God, give us a heart to be Bereans in this room, those that study the scriptures to see whether those things be so. God, the world doesn't need any more nominal Christians. Help us to be different in this room. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.